Okey. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to National Competitiveness Webinar Series. For today's uh, topics reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens to support economic growth on dealing with construction permits in Penang. So yang berbahagia uh, Datuk Abdul Latif Haji Besman, Director General of MPC, Deputy D Director General of MPC, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished speakers, on behalf of Malaysia Productivity Corporation MPC, we would like to thank to everybody for participation uh, for this morning webinars. In response to Malaysia Productivity Corporation (MPC) Malaysia Muda Initiative and call for online public consultation through Unified Public Consultation, in short UPC portal, Penang Speed S P E A D, which is consists of surveyor from uh, RISM, planner from MIP, engineer from IEM, architect from PAM, developer from Breda. Jointly give full support to identify unnecessary regulatory burdens, procedures, time, costs, and practical solution options from application until commencement of work to support economic growth and sustain employment in Penang. So for today's, we are very lucky. We are very feel great that we have all the professionals, considered all the professionals involved in the construction industries, which I mentioned earlier, we have surveyor, we have planner, we have uh, engineer, architects, and developer from uh, RENA. Okay. Without further ado, let's we begin this uh, webinar. We would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Dato' Abdul Latif Haji Abu Saman, Director General of MPC, to deliver his opening remarks. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I would like to bid a very big welcome to everyone to this National Competitiveness Webinar Series, uh, which is on reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens to support economic growth on dealing with construction permits, permits uh, uh, for the state of Penang. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the second installment of National Competitiveness Webinar Series entitled Reducing Unnecessary Burden to Support Economic Growth on Dealing with Construction Permits. My utmost appreciation uh, to the distinguished speakers today who will identify and deliberate on issues, challenges, and solutions pertaining to the unnecessary regulatory burdens, procedure, time and cost in construction application process to support economic growth and sustain employment in Penang. Ladies and gentlemen, today's webinar series is a result of MPC's Malaysia Muda, or in short, uh, My Muda program, an initiative to gather issues related to to unnecessary regulatory burdens and barriers affecting business development in Malaysia. And more importantly, to propose appropriate solutions to manage these challenges. Until 31st September 20, sorry, until 31st December 2020, My Muda has registered 373 issues through the Unified Public Consultation, in short, UPC portal, eh, in which MPC has successfully analyzed 30 issues and had proposed 64 recommendations to reduce unnecessary regulatory burdens on businesses. MPC has been working together with various government bodies and relevant private organizations through collaborative uh, 
through innovative collaboration to escalate business recovery, especially after being impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. MyBuddha has been launched at the state level to deep dive into more specific challenges in doing businesses going by the states. Today, we managed to gather key individuals with in-depth knowledge, expertise, and experience in the area of dealing with construction permits in our effort to assist development industry from going into recession and high unemployment rate in the state of Penang. The issue surrounding the dealing with construction permits in Penang has to be managed effectively by finding the most appropriate solutions to ensure seamless process from application until commencement of construction work. Malaysia has shown an impressive improvement in terms of ranking in dealing with construction permits or in short, eh, DCP, according to Doing Business or DB project, eh, which compares 190 economies globally. Malaysia is now ranked low, Malaysia, sorry, was ranked low when Doing Business was first initiated in 2007. The report uh, where it features Malaysia's performance in dealing with construction permit. Over six years, Malaysia had improved its ranking to a double digit in 2013. And impressively, in the recent years, the rank moved to number three in 2019 and to position number two in the year 2020 among 190 countries or economies. Staying, staying true to this, what is happening on the ground has to reflect Malaysia's international ranking in DCP. Now, uh, the study uh, focuses very much on uh, Kuala Lumpur, the biggest, I would say, uh, uh, you know, economy among all cities in Malaysia and performance were confined very much for Kuala Lumpur. But then when we talk about doing business uh, in Malaysia, it's not just doing business with Kuala Lumpur alone. We have got 13 states and we have got a number of cities. And uh, what happens uh, you know, on the efficiency of uh, dealing with construction permit need to be reflected also uh, you know, across uh, all cities in Malaysia. So this is an initiative. You want to make sure that what we have achieved in Kuala Lumpur would also be extended to the other cities in Malaysia. Now, each state and the players involved, who are the building blocks contributing to this solid position, have the responsibility to sustain the impressive state here, more importantly, to maintain the conducive environment to ease business development and economic recovery. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in our way uh, to move forward, uh, MPC and the relevant government ministries and the private sector through innovative collaborations, we must work together to catalyze our economy and create a robust ecosystem for businesses to flourish. The outcome shall benefit all of us in the end. So it is uh, about responsibility of everyone. It's not just the government alone. It's not just uh, businesses alone. I think all parties need to be involved. We have to work together and we need to move the country together. I uh, thank everyone for your contribution, uh, not just you know through this webinar series that we are organizing. I thank everyone also uh, their participation in all the other events and programs that we have organized to make Malaysia a place conducive to do business for everyone. And I believe uh, the uh, uh, climate which is conducive will not just be conducive to local businesses and investors alone, 
but also for uh, foreign investors, uh, which uh, you know will, would find Malaysia a place not just easy to do business, but we provide a very efficient uh, government uh, processes, procedures, services that would facilitate businesses to grow. And this would definitely contribute very much to Malaysia's you know, aspirations to be a developed nation with high income for its citizen. On that note, I wish you all well. I wish you all a productive session. Uh, please uh, bear in mind, uh, MPC would support all initiative that would make you know, Malaysia productive and uh, you know, higher economic growth for the benefit of all Malaysians. On that note, uh, I thank you all again and I wish you well uh, in this webinar series. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay productive. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Salam sejahtera. Take care. Thank you, Yang Berbahagia, Datuk Abdul Latif Fadhil Musiman, the Director General of uh, NPC. Thank you for your supports on uh, our uh, DC band uh, webinars. And also, thank you for your support for the initiative uh, under construction industries, which is that we believe that everybody look forward to enhance the product, product, productivity of uh, construction industries. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, before I introduce uh, our distinguished speakers today, as I mentioned, we have seven uh, speakers. So let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Azro Muhammad Dari from National Competitiveness Section NPC. And uh, we have today uh, our speaker, Surveyor Chuang, Kuang Han, Land Surveyor from Royal Institute of Surveyors Malaysia, RISM. Our second speaker, uh, we have uh, engineer Ng Sin Chi, CNS Engineer, Institute, Institution of Engineers Malaysia, IEM. Next, we have Surveyor So Sun Kui, Quantity Surveyor from Royal Institution of Surveyors Malaysia, RISM. Architect Liu Kuang Chun from uh, Malaysia Institute of Architects, PAM. We have Mr. Tan Hun Beng developer from Real Estate and Housing Developers Association, RADA. Engineer Darren Ku Junchia, M&E engineer from uh, Institution of Engineers Malaysia, IEM. Last but not least, we have town planner Lee Ham Kong from uh, Malaysia Institute of Planners Malaysia. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, before we start uh, to our first presentation, so again, on behalf of MPC, we really appreciate it on uh, your participation for today's uh, this morning webinars. So we will continue with the presentation from the first speakers. But before that, we believe that, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we have a lot of questions that will be answered by our distinguished speakers. So for this morning, we will proceed for all the seven presentations. After we completed the presentations, then we will open for Q&A sessions. So, but you can prepare your questions earlier. You can submit through the chat box. Please share your names and uh, where you are from, organizations. And uh, we try our best to deliver the questions to our distinguished speakers. Okay, let's we begin. Uh, for the first presentation, we would like to welcome Surveyor Chuang Kuan Han on the topics of RURB or Reducing Unnecessary Regulatory Burdens to Promote Economic Growth on Land Matters. Please welcome Surveyor Chuang. Thank you very much, Mr. Azro. Good morning to everybody. First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank MPC for taking the initiative on this MIMODA to reduce unnecessary regulatory burden to promote economic growth and job creation. I think it's very, very timely, such initiative, and to address our economic situation. So it's very, very timely, and we'd like to thank MPC for giving us the opportunity 
to share, identify, and share our views. Next. Before I go to the respective application, let me give an over, overview of economy in 2020. What are the issues that we are facing? We are now experiencing very poor demand in new launches, huge overhang in residential and commercial property. Now we got few new PKM. PKM stands for Promona Karam Rancha with commencement of work. Staff retrenchment, salary cut, high unemployment, business closing down, and public hardship. We already experienced recession. Government has to keep on providing fiscal and economic stimulus packages, initiatives worth billions to contain COVID-19, businesses to stay afloat, and people welfare. Overnight rate is at all-time low at 1.75. And they are still talking whether the need to go down to 1.25. So it is a very challenging time how to keep the economy going. If we continue the same housing policy, the same social guideline, contribution, compliances, policies, that is in the normal economy, we will definitely end up in higher unemployment, deepen our economic recession and social unrest. So the issue is, do we do something or we do nothing? Do we continue the same guideline, provision, contribution policies in the normal economy in year 2021? Here is where I give my solution option. First, establish MPC, speed state partnership to make my moda successful on a targeted basis. When I say targeted basis, I refer to first land development sector and each local authority level, then in Penang, instead of a national. So at the end, from the national level, we had to come down to the grassroots at the local authority level. The changes must come at the grassroots level. Just like in China, poverty eradication program, which is very successful, they go down to each county. Right? So similarly, here we hope that after this webinar, MPC, the speed and the state will work together to transform the current crisis into new job opportunities to sustain employment and to promote economic growth to collaboration and reducing unnecessary regulatory burden during this recession pandemic period. What is the normal regulation is now become an unnecessary regulatory burden when you don't have job, when you have unemployment, when you're struggling to pay people. So we have to think out of the box in this period. Number two, I propose that we establish an ad hoc state OSC for developer team to submit proposal to get approval in principle on concept and major technical requirement so that all the consultant can quickly prepare application simultaneously. It is critical to launch and start construction early to keep business stay afloat and prevent unemployment. At the moment, what happened is we submit and it will take two months or 108 days before we hear the decision. If we can get approval in principle by the top, consisting of the various chairmen of the technical, department, technical committee, such as state planning committee, land committee, and the hill land committee. These are the three major committee involved in development. If the chairman, together with the Dr. SUK, head of department, and the developer team, sit down together to go through to iron out the concept and the major technical requirement. That will mix a lot. So that we, after this approval in principle, the consultant can go back and quickly prepare the necessary application and we can submit simultaneously so that we can achieve commencement of work within six months. Because we need to launch early. Launching means money coming in. 
when the money comes in, then it trickles down the line to the consultant, to all the other business. If there's no launches, there's no money coming in. So we need to have something quick to give us the confidence and certainty that this project, we can get approval. The rest of the uh, compliance, we can come in when we submit the actual application. Number third, we need to increase the supply and demand chain through innovative ideas such as cheaper house, lower compliance costs, faster approval, less red tape, and early commencement of work. Unless we can create an increased supply, an increased demand, the supply will not come forth. The demand must be there. So that is where lowering compliance costs will help us in that. Next. Now I will focus on land application as a surveyor. There are so many applications that we need to submit in order to get our approval. One of them is land application. One of the most important things on land application is because we need to settle our land matter before we can commence work or before we can sell, before we can apply APDL. So it's very important to get our land set application approved fast so that we can proceed to apply APDL. If you look at the current practice on the left-hand side, you will see that we do have some application that need to be done before planning permission. This include conversion, water enamel of irrigation scheme, alienation of state land, and a lot long list. Those that does not require a planning approval. So we need to get that approved first despite the fact that OSC flowchart has already allowed us to submit simultaneously. Until today, we still have a problem trying to achieve that on the ground. Yeah? Since 2007, OSC says can be done simultaneously. Right now, we are still doing one at a time. So this LA1, land application one, is still ha happening until today. This will take us nine months. So if we have to do this land matter, it will mean that we have been nine months delay before we can submit our planning permission. Next, we have the planning permission. So the planning permission will take us about four months, followed by the next land application, LA2, which has to be done after the planning permission, such as subdivision, amalgamation, simultaneous subdivision, and conversion under section 124A, and surrender and re under section 204D. So now we have two land application, one before planning and one after planning. So we have to submit through OSD and Jabatan Prancang for endorsement for the pre-com plan. That takes us three months. Followed by, once we have the endorsement from Prancang, we have to submit to land office. Only then the land office will prepare the paper, accept our application and prepare the ESCO paper site visit. That will take us about three months, if not more. Then we have the next stage at PDG, where it will table for Lancom and ESCO approval. That will take us about three months. Then land office will issue us the decision letter within two weeks. Lastly, we have to submit payment and apply QT. So all in all, it will take us under the current practice, it will take us 25 months, two years. Can we afford that? We cannot afford that under these circumstances where unemployment, business thing afloat is a real, real concern. So what is the solution option available? Just follow the OSC flowchart. It's already there. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now we just have to comply and to interpret such a way that we facilitate instead of frustrating. Any delay means we are sinking. Yeah, that's why we have to quickly get the thing approved so that we can move on to launch, to sell. So under the solution option, what we propose is just follow the OSC flowchart, which is already in place, but it's not been implemented. Number one, all land matters and planning permission can be submitted simultaneously. Jabatan Prancang can issue the endorsed pre plan together with the approved KM and Borang C1. 
as opposed to doing it number two and number three. So we can combine this number two and number three into one process and doing it simultaneously. There we can short, shorten the time. Then number four, OSC submit the approved KM and the C1 to land office directly without having to go through surveyor. Then the land office can prepare the PDG ESCO paper. As a matter of fact, since they are already involved up front during the planning stage, so they already got all the site visit report done, preparation, and check whether it can be approved or not. So once the plan comes to OS, uh, PD, land office, if it, they shorten the time, within a month, they can send the ESCO paper to PDG. And because PDG is also involved up front during the camp stage, they can also reduce the time. All in all, if we continue with that, we will have only 10 months under this one. It's half the time. And that means a lot when business is really, really low. Next. This is a perennial issue. Chicken and egg planning or lamb approval first. Apparently on the ground, planning department is still saying land approval first, the land application one. Conversion must be done first, right? So is the land office. So under the Penang MPPP, it requires us to get ground approval for land conversion, water enactment, accession of gazetted irrigation area, accession of gazetted hill land, alienation of state land, such as back lane or root reserve abutting the lot before PKM can be submitted. They do not allow us to submit simultaneous planning permission with 124A or 204D. I've been fighting this for many years and yet it's not, ha not happening. Whereas in MPSP, it requires prior approval for water enactment, the LA1, accession of irrigation area, accession of hill land, alienation of state land, before PKM can be submitted, but they do allow simultaneous PKM with 124A and 204D since the very beginning. That I would like to commend them on this. Whereas MPPP I have not been able to achieve it for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure. Third thing, PDG and land office. There is a circular issue, circular number three stroke 2012 that require prior approval before KM can be submitted. Those applications involved are water enactment, accession, gazetted hill land, alienation of state land, etc. before PKM can be submitted. So they only allow simultaneous PKM with 124A and 204D application, but they do not process, do, do not accept the application. They just allow the planning part to go. So what is the solution option? So with this current practice, there is a delay for us to submit planning permission because we have to settle this land application LA1 first. That is nine months delay. So the solution is planning must always come first. It's not chicken and egg, it's planning, right? Number two, we must allow and encourage Simultaneous application for KM with all type of land application. It has been since so many years, they say, oh, you can only use it for 124A and 204D, not other land application, such as acquisition of new land, water enactment, conversion. Why just these two and not all? So even OSC have already approved in 2012, under OSC 3.0, they still refuse to accept other type of application. Solution, just follow the OSC 3 plus and OSC 3.0 manual and flowchart. It's already there. We don't have to invent. It's been sorted out at federal level. Number four is to repeal this percolating because every now and then they will use this circular to say, yes, we have to do it because our percolating says so. But that percolating is outdated by the introduction of OSC 3.0 and 3.0 plus, where we have already allowed other type of ap land application concurrent with KM. But on the ground, it is not happening. This will reduce nine months for PKM delay. 
And the most important part, if, if we were to do conversion first before PKM, there will be a risk of money loss if the PKM is rejected. Once you pay, you cannot get it back. Next. Next, please. Endorse pre complaint by Japatam Pranchang. At the moment, Japatam Pranchang takes three months to issue endorse pre complaint. The purpose of endorsing pre complaint is to certify that the subdivision plan or the pre complaint showing the subdivision is the same as the approved layout. Why it take three months? And why does it wait until the layout is approved? And it requires another OSC meeting instead of the same day if we were to submit simultaneously. So the solution option is to allow and encourage simultaneous application for KM and all types for land application. OSC table land application and PKN on the same OSC meeting as stipulated in the OST flowchart and manual. Jabatan Prancang to issue endorse pre complaint together with the approved PKM plan and Form 1. This will reduce us three months right, in land application. So if that can be done, that will save us time and cost. Fourth is the conversion premium. In Penang, when we do surrender and re under 204 d or simultaneous subdivision and conversion, conversion premium include surrendered areas such as the road reserve, drain reserve, open space, sewer treatment plant, oxidation pond, school, etc. Instead of just those plots with land title issue, the surrender area can be as much as 30% or more compared with the original area. This translates to a very large amount to be paid and it's unfair to pay to convert your present land to become a building category or with the right express condition, then you surrender FOC. At the moment in Penang, the conversion premium from agriculture to development is 15% of the of the market value of the land after conversion so it's very common to see millions of dollars in premium to be paid upfront before you can even do your pkm imagine that or you want to change your express condition that will cost you five percent any change of the wording in the express condition Sharanyata, will cost you five percent under the new category and if the land area is big, which is very common nowadays, that is a huge amount. Now, what is the solution option? Calculate conversion premium only for those plots with land title issue when using 124A or 204D, surrender and, re surrender and realignation application. Use a new conversion premium formula, which is eight times the quick rent of each parcel. Follow the Kedah model. This is transparent, fair, and promote growth. Next. Land office process land application during PKM. At the current practice, land office, PTD stands for Pertabe Tanah Daerah, accept and process land applications such as subdivision, surrender and re, all that only after the pre plan has been endorsed by Japatan Pranchang, even though we submitted simultaneous application. So this will cause us delay in land application. Solution option are land office to accept and start processing land application while PKM planning permission is being processed. This is already stated in the OSC flowchart since 2007. But until now, this has not been done. It's been done in Kedah, where they process it. This will reduce us six months, time and cost. Next. Manual submission and processing land application. 
Our current practice is land application submission and processing are still manual and not through OSC. Buying land title search are still manual. We have to queue up at the land office and we have to come back a few days later, especially if you were to buy a official search. It will take us seven days to come back. Payment has to be done manual at the counter. Meeting, discussion, to gather data are still physical. We have to go to the office to check out. What about the solution option? We propose that the land application be fully online and through OSE. This is following OSE flowchart and manual. It's just not implemented on the ground for all the reason. Hard copy submission to be allowed by Send Korea. Online land title search using email, online payment. If you can buy a company search now online, why can't it be done? Meeting has been done online. We have sent our drawing through email. Why can't that be done? All right. We have made payment. All kind of payment now is done online. Then when it comes to the data gathering, meeting, discussion, we propose that that also can be done online through video conferencing. Instead of we go physically, now because of work from home, when it, a staff is work from home, that means we have to wait until he come back to office to work. We cannot get hold of him. Department to issue a Zoom ID, password, email, and telephone. At least he can still work from home. Right now, when work from home means we have to wait until he come back to office physically. And that also we got to wait. We do not know which day. So if we can do like this webinar online, discussion online, we can show all our plan online. Why can't it be done the same thing instead of having we go manual? Next. In summary, all the proposed options on land application are as follows. Establish MPC speed state partnership to make my model successful on a targeted basis. For now, development sector and each PBT. Establish an ad hoc state OSC for approval in principle on concept and requirement. Major key points, major issue that we need to discuss, especially from consultant to the technical department. We need to get that firm up. Then we can go to prepare our plan in detail for submission and do it all simultaneously instead of sequentially. Number three, to increase supply and demand chain for development sector. So if the authority can consider setting aside the compliance costs and speeding up approval, this will increase this supply and demand chain. Simultaneous application for all planning permission with all type of land application involved. Just follow the OSC, OSC 3.0, 3.0 plus, that is already in place and repeal the PDG circular, which is outdated in view of the new manual introduced under OSC 3.0 in 2015. So that circular is already outdated. OSC to table land application and planning permission, planning permission on the same meeting so that they do not have to table one more time to prepare the paper for OSC meeting. Japatan Prancang to issue endorse pre plan together with the approved planning plan and the form C1. New conversion premium formula, eight times quit rent and only for those block with land title issue. Land office to accept and shorten processing land application while PKM is being processed instead of waiting until the pre plan is endorsed. Land application, Land title search payment fully online and email. Sometimes it get too much bogged down with this little bit of inefficiency of the program. Worst to worst, we just email right, whatever that is need to be done. Hard copies submission through Korea. Lastly, we really hope that government agencies staff dealing with public can be made available through video conferencing eight to five by giving us by displacing the Zoom ID and the password. It's just like an email and the phone number that you see written on the approval letter. 
So it's important that we make this whole thing works so that we can really save ourselves from the economic downturn. With that, I return back to Mr. Azro. Okay, thank you, Survey Chuang, uh, for the presentations. So um, our distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, another six presentations here from the six presenters. So uh, we would like to um, inform our distinguished speakers that uh, since we have uh, many numbers of uh, presentations, so probably we can uh, uh, maximum our duration of presentation to five to, to 15 minutes. All right. So because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of questions uh, uh, to be raised by our uh, audience, eh, our participants. So let's continue with the second presentation uh, from, we would like to invite uh, Tom Penner, Lee Ham Kong okay, on the process of planning permission application. Please uh, welcome uh, Tom Penner, Lee. Okay, a very good morning. I thank you, Jazro. A very good morning to everyone. I am Lee Ham Kong representing Malaysian Institute Planners and Northern Branch. The slide and information used in this presentation here are the result of an arrangement of our member who have came to us to provide constructive comment and input based on their own experience in dealing with planning permission. And taking this opportunity here to highlight challenges and issues that may and that many has faces, especially in the aspect of dealing with town agencies. We hope that after today, the relevant party and the policy maker will consider to cut short lengthy procedure and to relook the existing requirement on how to improve or find ways to accelerate development process. My briefing is focused on planning permission application process from pre-consultation stage until issuance of planning permission, which include, but not limited to, the whole process of planning permission application, procedure to be reviewed, proposed deregulation of unnecessary regulatory, and suggest solutions. Next. This is the flowchart showing the planning application process, both apply to MBSP and MBPP. And the stages start from pre-consultation, followed by online submission, then hard copy submission, technical comment, technical compliance, then put into OAC for decision, whether it's for approval, conditional approval or rejections. Subsequently, the issuance of either Borang C1 or C2 approval or rejection letter. Next. Then the agenda for discussion today cover the following. Number one would be the verification of the building lot. We will explain in detail later. Number two would be the removal of unnecessary procedures or requirement. Number three would be the confirmation of what the amendment act. And number four, correspondent from authority. There will be some example. Show. Then number five, online submission checklist. Six, issuance of technical comments. Seven, but not least, issuance of Polang C1 or C2. Next. Then this is the existing uh, MPPP and BSP permit planning permission for chart. It will take about 85 to 108 days. This is a typical, but now they are reviewing to, short, to cut short the number of days. And uh, the very crucial part would be the Borang C1 or Borang C2 to be released within seven days and some may up to three months or more. That is the topic that we need to discuss and definitely there will be some issues and problems and, and this uh, on both parties are either on the authority or on the ASP. Next. Then uh, what are the issues and uh, problems that, that uh, the member face? We start from pre-consultations, the enabling lot ownership verifications. The MBSP, the process of enabling lot verification takes three to five days by planning department. They are doing some checking. And the MBPP enabling lot verification process is checked by OSC. 
whereby MBSP take three to five days and MVPP is checked on the spot, which is a simple procedure, checking on the nebling lock. We would suggest that MPSP to verify the nebling locks on the spot as well, even though it's three to five days. And for MVPP, there's no issue on that. Then for PTD and PTG, normally it takes around one to two weeks to verify nebling locks that involve government land. In some circumstances, there are some lands where there is no folio, means the applicant has to write to PTD or PTG for confirmation of land ownerships. So, but normally the one to two weeks time uh, taken by PTD or PTG, we would request that the PTG or PTG to process within three to five days. And for some unrecorded cases, PTD or PTG are unable to provide confirmation within the time stipulated up to several months. So under these special cases, we would request that OSC should consider accepting the submission should PTD or PTG fail to issue lock verification, meaning to say pengasahan, pemilikan tanah, after a month. Okay, number two, we are focusing on removal of some procedure and requirement. We put some example like EIA report and RSA. Based on the guidelines, EIA and RSA are not required for commercial development of not more than 45,000 square feet and for residential development of not more than 200 units. Regardless, the subject authority in some instance would verbally request for TIA to be submit and approved and RSA to be endorsed to be submitted prior to submission of planning application. Under this procedure, it will take is a very lengthy procedure and even though the development is small, so our suggestion is to follow the gazetted guidelines and requirement. It is being gazetted that the commercial less than 45,000 or residential less than 20 units, you don't need to submit the PIA or the ISA. Next. Then for water enactments uh, confirmation against, this is, uh, I think every topic covered this. For MBSP, confirmation of water enactment is not required. So there is no issue for MBSP. However, for MBPP, confirmation of water enactment is required to be applied from JPS and subsequently from PTD. There will be two stages of process. This procedure take at least four weeks time. So our suggestion is that if there is no existence of waterway on the site, this prerequisite should be made. And number two, if there is waterway, for example, earth drain on the site, OAC should allow for the process of confirmation of water enactment to be carried out concurrent with planning permission application. This is to avoid redundancy since OAC will refer the same application to department that include JPS and PTD unless there is a gazetted river which require approval for re realignment. The approval must be conditional release of Porang C1. And water enactment confirmation should be waived for application involved on the operation and addition. Okay, next. Then there are for letter correspondent from authority. For example, in MBPP, the confirmation of letter certified for Chukai Tapseran for the assessment. It may also refer to the company directors on the checking and also the development company itself. So are required prior to online submissions. In general practice, variation department will take two to three weeks to reply. There are two stages here where you know, there's one they have to go to the unit hassle for checking and confirmation. They will take a few days. And then after that, write to valuation department for confirmation or written confirmation. So our suggestion is that OSC will refer to valuation department to ascertain whether there are areas on assessment by the company or personal area by the company director. If there are the area, proof of settlement ought to be provided as prerequisite for the tabling of the application in OSC meeting. Meaning to say this process can be 
work concurrently upon planning submission since there is uh, a reference to the respective department for confirmation of the Cukai Taksiran. Okay, then number five is checking online submission. Um, normally for online submission, after the pre-consultation, the process of document checking by OSC take about seven days per cycle, whereby MBPP takes about three days per cycle. So our suggestion is that uh, we will request MBSP to follow the uh, MBPP, which take three days per cycle, even though it's a few days, but a few rounds is take weeks also. And for hard copy submission, there's no comment for the hard copy submission is pretty smooth. Next. Then for issuance of technical comment, for MBSP, planning department does not release the comment from respective technical department until maturity date. In the meantime, the plan after incorporating the compliance to the technical command must be written within seven days or with the extension of seven days. So our suggestion is that we propose all technical departments to upload their respective command in the portal for easy reference and quicker compliance. Alternatively, OAC or planning department can assist to upload the command in the portal or for receive. For MBPP, UP had already done the same process, therefore there is no issue for MBPP. Then the, for technical compliance, there is no comment on that for both. And then OIC meeting for decision, there is also no comment on that because it's tabling into the OIC for decision and sometimes the result can know on the spot whether it's approved, approved with condition or rejections. But however, for the period for issuance of warrant C1 and C2, so the time taken for the release of official approval or rejection letter, either warrant C1 or warrant C2, is too long. It may vary from seven days to three months or more. So for conditional approval, additional time for the compliance is more acceptable. However, if the planning application is approved within outstanding, uh, without outstanding issue, there should be no reason for delay for the issuance of Warang C1. So we would like to propose that the approval or the rejection letter, if any, to release within 7 to 14 days. Okay, next. So what is our recommendation and conclusion? We are, we are make it fast and, and, and short. We seek consideration of our proposal or recommendation to reduce unnecessary regulatory burden to support economic growth by the higher authority and or policy maker. The coordination and cooperation between internal departments are highly appreciated. Should there be any agreed or approved regulation or policy, they are to be immediately broadcasted to the respective department for concurrent update of checklist to reduce unnecessary misunderstanding between the department and PSP. This is always happen, the coordination among department. Then uh, we would like to suggest uploading all the new guidelines, if any, or the policies or requirements on the online portal for general reference instead of keep by the departmental as solid document. So it is a fact that undeniable, there are some cases whereby PSP is slow and cannot comply certain condition within the stipulated time frame, which resulted in delay of issuance of Warrant C1. Therefore, it is recommended that both local authorities and involved PSP to work hand in hand to iron out the issues. In the meantime, professional bodies can review the performance of the PSP so that both parties can effectively cooperate to promote and generate economic growth especially in the current economic situation. All right, thank you. That's all for my slide presentation today. All right, thank you, Tom Planner, Lee Ham Kong. So we believe that uh, the point of presentation from uh, Tom Planner, Lee Ham Kong, looking forward to accelerate the application process from the, the day the submission until the, the, the uh, getting the approval uh, from the uh, planning permission. Okay, so 
let's we continue for the next presentation. Uh, this time around, we go and to hear from the other uh, angle of uh, construction industries. This is, comes from the engineering CNS. I would like to in invite engineer Ng Sin Chi uh, for the presentation. Please proceed, engineer Ng. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Injek. Uh, Muhammad Asro Mahatari, Deputy Directors of Malaysian Productivity Corporation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Engineer Ng Sin Chi. I'm a civil engineer representing the Institution of Engineer Malaysia, the Nine Brand, to present our talk on the special topic today, that is reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens to support economic growth on during the construction permit in the Nine. Undoubtedly, worldwide COVID-19 pandemic and the imposition of MCO in Malaysia has greatly affected the economic growth, especially so in the development and construction industry. We fully agree that it is timely to look into way and mean in reducing the unnecessary burden to support the economic growth. It is also IEM Penang Brand wishes that at this difficult time, certain unnecessary and overlapping regulatory burdens in terms of procedures, and requirements, time and cost could be reviewed either temporarily or even permanently to assist to stimulate the economic growth in this sector. Of course, as always, public safety shall remain as a priority and shall not be sacrificed in any way. The submission and execution of works is in the critical path of many development and construction projects. It is our wish that certain repetitive procedures and requirements could be reduced or waived at this difficult situation to ease the industry. We realize that the function and role of JKR and JPS with regard to the submission, execution, completions of over is indeed very minimum and repetitive to a certain way with the local authority, that is MDPP and MDSP. IEM Penang branch is of the opinion that the stringent permitting requirements, the demanding monitoring of works, the strict enforcement on the execution procedures as imposed by the local authorities are already more than adequate to ensure safe compliance and completion of effort. As such, we wish to appeal that the submission of effort plan to JKR and JPS be waived, at least at this difficult time, to cut short the permitting time to about one to two months. Let us go through a little detail in the whole process for effort with regard to submissions, approval, execution and completions. The urban plan submission requirement. Both local authority, MBPP or MBSB, allow simultaneous submission of urban plan together with DKM submission or after the approval of DKM. There's no issue here. The principal submitting person or the submitting person can decide when to submit the urban plan depending on the type and nature of the project. Here's stage two, if submission, for submission after approval of DKM, uh, latest certified land title, uh, land search, that is Jarian plot, certified plan, which have already been submitted by planner or, or surveyor during the PKM stage are required to be submitted again with the urban plan uh, submission. These documents are repetitive and not necessary as it has already been submitted and confirmed during the PKM stage. Hence, urban plan to be treated as a pure technical plan without further confirmation on the land matter. As mentioned by uh, Mr. Chuang and 
Zoria Zhuang and uh, Lena Michelin. To get the land title and land search is a tedious process. You've got to queue up at Compa, you've got to make payment and come back to collect it after seven days. So uh, we're hoping that this process could be safe. Next stage, you'll come to approval of urban plan. The final approval for urban plan from the local authority are subjected to the obtain of prior approval from JKR and JPS. Frequently, time taken to get approval from JKR and JPS could result in the original submission to OSC being rejected, withdrawn, or sometimes frankly being forfeited. Uh, for granting approval of urban plan by JKR, JKR will require a deposit of minimum 15,000. And this amount could be many, many times more depending on the assumed location of the source of earth. And deposit is paid for the maintenance of public road, possibly caused by overloaded earth carrying vehicle. Other than that, JKR issue no specific technical requirement to the urban plan. We are of the opinion that the urban contractor are indeed registered with CIDB. The, the overloaded earth carrying vehicle are not allowed under any contract. As such, the imposition of, by JKR of the deposit is in, indeed very, very subjective as they may or may not be any overloaded vehicle running on the public road, which at the same time used by many other public vehicle too. Damages to the road may not necessarily be caused by contractor. We are also of the opinion that stringent action and enforcement could indeed be taken by the relevant authority like JPJ, traffic police, traffic enforcement and etc. Again, any overloading vehicle. We would like to appeal to waive the payment of deposit and also the submission of a plan to JKR. As for JPS, JPS normally provide uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, JPS normally provide technical comments on the temporary drainage system, uh, including situation form, sedimentation form, uh, ESCP, fire wall spacing, etc. All these technical comments are very much overlapped with the requirements of both DDP. In fact, similar or more stringent requirements are imposed by the DDP. Hence, this comment from JPS are merely repetitive with the requirements of uh, the lo local authority and are deemed unnecessary. Okay, after getting approval of a plan to talk about uh, commencement of work. Okay, uh, both local authority have own preset requirements for the applications of commencement of a work. However, there's no reference is required to be made to JKR or JPS at this stage. Uh, you can see that the involvement of JKR from after the approval is actually very minimal. Uh, next, execution of over. The execution of over are generally actively and adequately monitored by the local authority. The local authority have very stringent control and monitoring requirements to be fulfilled during and throughout the construction period of a work. For example, uploading of site progress photograph on a bi-weekly basis, submit a work progress report on a bi-weekly basis. We are of the opinion that uh, the local authorities are doing a very good job in controlling the execution of a work. And, and throughout the whole stage of the execution of a work, 
the involvement of JKR and JPS is indeed minimum or negligible. Next. Upon completion of urban, both local authorities have to set requirements for application for completion of urban. However, clearances from JKR and JPS is normally not required for completion of urban. No approval are required from JKR and JPS2 for the submission of G form. Hence, as discussed above, we can see that JKR and JPS only play some either non technical or repetitive role during the submission and approval stage. There's no involvement of JKR and JPS during commencement, execution, and completion stage. As such, on behalf of IEM, we wish to appeal that the submission of plan to JKR and JPS be waived, at least at this critical situation. Uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to talk about commencement of building work, uh, which is normally allowed for after completion of effort. Both local authorities have own requirements for the submission of commencement of building works. We are of the opinion that it is sometimes impractical to allow the submission for commencement of building work only after the completion of effort. Because Earthwork and the foundations of building work like piling, substructure, and sometimes retaining structural work. They are integrated and interrelated with the earthwork. It is at times impossible or impractical to define the completion of earthwork alone without completing part of the building work. So we also wish to appeal to allow the principal submitting person or the submitting person to determine the construction sequence and to submit for commencement of building work as the most suitable and practical timing, even before the completion of work. Uh, thank you. I, I think that's all from IEM. Back to you, Engineer Asso. Yeah, thank you, Engineer Ng, for your presentation. Uh, talk about the perspective under engineering CNS. So more to, um, from my, my observation, more to a process uh, related to earthworks okay? and uh, so on. So um, next presentation, uh, we would like to invite uh, another professional from uh, engineering, uh, but this time uh, is uh, from MNE. Uh, so please welcome IR uh, Darren Koo for your presentation. Yeah, thanks. Inject Astro, Deputy Director from MPC. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Darren Koo from IEM. I'll be presenting on M&E items on how to reduce the unnecessary regulatory burden to support our economic growth. So we have actually highlighted the major concern from most of our practicing engineers and from developers, from the industrial and industrial foreign investor to, to these slides. So, so this, these are the items where we think it could be, it could be easily resolved and it could reduce the permitting timeline. Okay, next. Okay, so, okay for item number one, as you know, Penang has many foreign investors and the foreign investor account to about 15 to 17 billion per year in Penang. And Penang is also one of the top recipient for foreign investor. As such, the, and as you know, for industrial building, power supply demand is high with short lead time. TMD power supply delivery schedule usually unable to meet client requirements. For an example, a typical 300 to 500,000 square feet of industrial building is built within eight to 10 months and the 11 kV or the 3 kV incoming power supply is expected between five to six months for the commissioning of major M&E system and major process utilities. So 
I am proposal would be to recommend TMB power supply delivery for the fast track industrial building to be five months for 11 kV and eight months for 33 kV. And how can we achieve this? We can achieve this by having a pre-consult sub for substation with maximum demand and schedule of power supply required to be considered as official submission. And BP CAM and BP approval documents can be processed in parallel at later stage because we just need to submit a very quick high figure so that all parties are aligned on, on how much power we need to, to streamline the energization date and the process. Okay. For item two, it is more relevant to the developer uh, where TMB power supply cables root cut permit takes longer time for approval and root cut security deposit payment by developer or client is not recommended usually. This is because the root excavation is done by TNB appointed subcontractors. So for this, we propose TNB to deposit a blanket banker guarantee to local authority like, like MPSP, MBPP, JKR or PDC. Uh, so this is also uh, beneficial to both all parties in the sense that the root cut permit can utilize the blanket banker guarantee and, and TMB doesn't have to issue different banker guarantee for different projects which takes time and, and which delay the permitting process. So, so this shortened root cut permit approval lead time. For item, for issue three, it's also correlate to issue two, where TMB apply for root cut permit towards the end of project upon, after appointing their subcontractor via their protocol. So we, we would recommend TMB to apply root cut permit before their subcontractors are appointed and request, we also request respective council like MBPP and MPSP to proceed to process root cut permit even before TMB has appointed their subcon. So, so this is also to enable timely energization for the developers to towards the end of the project and to hand over the project. Okay, next. In terms of strata title housing scheme, Certain TMB officers request to lease the area for 11 kV, 11 kV cables route from TMB substation until the right of way. And further to our check with land surveyor, land surveyor has highlighted the land need to be drawn early during CAM stage. On the other hand, TMB is unable to provide cable route during CAM stage, which is understandable because uh, TMB would need time to study their cable route. So we would propose for TMB land service department to align among to align internally and to waive land subdivision requirement. Uh, this is because we have another set of Vajanjan Izin Lalu, which will be signed between the developer and TMB to authorize TMB access for the cable service and maintenance anytime when they need. Okay, for last item, there are some updates from TMB requirement, uh, which are informed verbally, uh, usually. So we would propose TMB to issue official circulation to all practicing engineers from time to time, uh, and also circulate to developers architects and other professional bodies so that every party is aligned and also to help both and also to benefit it is also beneficial to TNB that uh, TNB don't have to explain their requirement every time. Okay, next. So for M&E services, other than TNB, we would also need to submit for telecommunication and SKMM. Um, 
the issue, the common, there are two common issues we face that there is late reply of Surat Sokongan Kemajuan during KM stage from telco service provider. So we feel that this is uh, not required because uh, telco services is compulsory nowadays and, and we would appeal it to be changed to acknowledgement receipt for various telco company that, that we are having that development. In terms of item two, Telecom Malaysia, uh, we understand Telecom Malaysia is still imposing plan processing fee where other telco service providers are providing free of charge processing and plan approval process. So we would also appeal to Telecom to consider waiver for plan processing fee. Uh, so, so to be aligned for, for all service provider. Yep. Street lighting is uh, another concern recently where most council would like to move from the conventional lighting to the energy efficient LED lighting, which has raised uh, quite a number of concerns. So, so for item one, street lighting submission need to wait until road and drainage approval and approve. It's not only approval, but also need to be approved for submission. And this has usual, this would usually delay street lighting plan approval. So we, we suggest street lighting to be allowed to be submitted in parallel with road and drainage plan submission so that the council can process uh, street lighting in concurrent with road and drainage to expedite street lighting plan approval and also to enable the street lighting to be installed when the road and drainage is constructed. For item two, street lighting plan with lux level simulation and additional street lights are required for new project or existing building refurbishment where there is no any road construction. So we propose to waive street lighting submission for projects where there's no road and drainage change. And, and the handed over road illumination submission shall be under the responsibility of previous engineer who has endorsed the previous submission. So yeah, so this is our proposal. Okay, next. In terms of JKR, PBT for MBPP and MPSP, the major concern is still the root cutting and the TMB power supply, TMB power supply. So, so it takes longer time for approval and root cut payment, deposit payment is not recommended as what we have mentioned. So we would, we would appeal, uh, the respective council to consider a blanket banker guarantee from TMB. If, uh, if the respective council do not accept, then we, we hope that at least the council can accept the deposit from the respective developer. Uh, so, so that it shortened the permit for, it shortened the energization date and it shortened the root cut permit delay to, to all projects. So I think that's all for m and &E, &E practicing engineers concern. Thank you, Mr. Asru. Okay, thank you, Engineer Paul, uh, for your presentation on the perspective from engineering m and &E. So ladies and gentlemen, we already uh, completed four presentations from our four distinguished speakers. Uh, starting from the surveyors, Chuang, continued by uh, town planner, and then the, we have uh, our two professionals from the engineer, engineering. Uh, now we move to our uh, next speakers, our fifth, fifth speakers. So uh, the topic will be building plans, application, and notification to start work. Okay? So we would like to 
invite uh, architect KC Liu for the presentation. Please proceed, uh, architect KC Liu. Can you see you? All right. All right. Never mind. So probably we hello, to... hello. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there was a power cut. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sure. Please proceed. Hi, hi, hi. Good morning. Uh, thank you, MPC, and uh, thank you, Jazro, for the opportunity to share some information on how to reduce regulatory burden on the construction process to promote economic growth. Um, okay, so I'll be focusing on a uh, two segment, uh, the building plan application and notification to start work. Uh, it'll be a very brief one. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, in part, there'll be two parts. Uh, part A will be uh, to do with the uh, building uh, plan station, part B notification to start work. So a lot of our members, uh, and I think uh, together with uh, other consultants, uh, they are actually requesting for pre-consultation via video conferencing. Obviously during this time, uh, it saves time as well. People have been kind of complaining that they have to come from KL and to see the officer and so on and so forth. So this is a, a bit of a no brainer uh, that in the future, I think uh, pre-consultation should be uh, via video conferencing if it's possible. Okay, uh, next. Uh, video conferencing obviously could you know, save a lot of time, uh, especially from people who are outstation. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, this is the building plan uh, flowchart. Before I go further, I'd like to kind of stress that actually PAM and other uh, institution has been working with MPPP and uh, MPSP to uh, reduce the time frame from some of this process, but it has not been adopted by MPPP yet. If you look at the time frame on the left hand side, it says 32 days. The original is actually 37 days, so we already saved five days. Um, on the right hand side, you can see there are lots of uh, requirements in terms of the documents. I will come back to this a little bit later uh, because uh, the documents actually uh, has already been submitted before, but they're asking for it again at building plan stage. I will explain uh, towards the end of the presentation how this can be overcome. Okay, next. Okay, at building plan stage, I think this has been uh, highlighted already by a previous uh, speaker. Bungasan Water and Amman Act could actually take up the four weeks. Um, like uh, uh, planner Mr. Lee said, if there's no obvious uh, bottle body, really this should be waived. And item two, the agency respond instead of you know the usual two or three weeks, I think it should be limited to one week. I don't think it's a very difficult exercise so item two, Bengasan Chukai Taksiran also have been mentioned. Um, sometimes it could take up to three weeks, uh, but I think uh, town planner, Mr. Lee has also mentioned that this could be incorporated in the time frame for the planning application so that we don't lose any pre-time pre uh, uh, before the planning application. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, during planning stage, uh, a lot of our members have an issue with neighbor's consent. Uh, those actually for BP application where, whereby uh, they don't send out notification uh, notice to the neighbors. Problems encounter if you need neighbor's consent is that neighbors sometimes are not available. They may be overseas or they can't get everybody together and so on. And some neighbors are not willing to sign and consent 
And there is no time limit for a neighbor to respond at the moment. And sometimes neighbors can request for unreasonable undertaking. For example, one job I did, the hotel next door require my client to pay him uh, money for you know, losing the hotel room during construction. So that's very unreasonable. So our recommendation for neighbor's consent is to completely omit this procedure uh, because I think the letter of undertaking from the owner will be sufficient. Insurance will be taken out by uh, the client to cover any mishap to affect the properties anyway. So item, the other item, if neighbor's consent is required, it, the neighbor must respond within two weeks after receiving written notification, failing which the development will be allowed to proceed accordingly. We cannot wait forever, I think. Okay, item four, this is a general thing that our members are encountering. Uh, and I presume this is not new. I think some of our speakers already mentioned it. Some of the change of procedure and paperwork uh, not coming through to our members uh, quick enough. So um, we recommend that, uh, I think uh, one of the speaker recommend they upload these information into a portal, uh, council's portal, so that people can access it or the council has to disseminate the information as quick as possible, okay? Next, this is part two uh, for next, Okay, notification to start work. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, have been working with uh, MPPP, PAM and other institution. And uh, I don't think it has been adopted yet. So after you uh, get your building plan approved, you have to submit for COW. I think that will take you another two weeks. And then after you get your COW, you have to submit a Borang B for start work and then takes another four or five days, okay? So altogether, it will take you almost three weeks. I think uh, there's something in the process whereby COW and the start work will be amalgamated into a segment called notification to start work. In other words, after you get your building plan approval, you submit what is called notification to start work. You do away with COW and the Borang B to start work. Now, okay, the problem, I think, we have is actually, if you look at the left-hand side, takes about five days, uh, OSC will take one and a half days, so it's about six and a half days, which is very good compared to having the COW and the Borang B submission to start work. Three weeks reduce to one week, very good. However, if you look on the right-hand side, I don't want to go through the details. There are a lot of forms that are duplicated you know, uh, as you can see, uh, all the forms are already submitted during building plan application. So they are asking you to repeat most of the forms. Some actually are required, but most are actually repeated. And there is a danger that, uh, you know, sometimes you might miss one form and you have to go back to the very beginning. So uh, it's a waste of time. So uh, next. So we actually recommend that on the right-hand side, no need to resubmit repeated documents. Documents that have been approved by the council previously should somehow be linked up to the building department so that they will also have a record. They don't need to ask for additional ones because this take time, you know. Next. This is just a summary of uh, how documents and information within the uh, department and also for the PSP. So if you go on the left-hand side, pre-application, we apply for information, documents, receipt, et cetera, et cetera. And then the PSP submits to the planning department. And you go down decision by authorities that give you approval condition and so on. And then the applicants input on the planning department side, they will submit necessary document, the green, green color by the PSP. And then when it moves to the building department, they're still asking you information that you already submitted. So what we are suggesting is the building, the planning department have already have all this information already approved. So the information from these, from planning department can be relayed to the building department in the orange color. So documents will be given to the building department, approval and condition will also be given 
if you scroll down, it, it will be given to the building department. So any additional information from the applicant, then they will add it on. So when we come to notification to start work, the information that is from the building department can be forwarded to the application. So any additional necessary document from the PSB can be supplied to supplement outstanding information instead of repeating, you know, having to submit the same thing again, because that takes time. The streamlining in conclusion will make the application process more efficient and simpler. And then it will reduce unnecessary paperwork and also reduce the possibility of error when compiling the submission. I think this may be in progress in MPPP. So uh, I look forward to that uh, change in there to make the system more efficient and more simple for applicants. I mean, in conclusion, if you remember, if you were to apply for passport in the past, it will take you probably one or two months. Nowadays, actually, they have streamlined the application and can, you can get your passport in 48 days, you know? So I think if they can do it in a passport office, I think in the local authorities, they can streamline it, make it more and more efficient for applicants, thereby, you know, helping uh, to reduce the economic uh, regulatory burden and also help economic growth. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, architect Casilio, for your presentations. Uh, at the perspective of uh, architects on the process of building plan application and also notification to start work. Uh, 